everybody, welcome to Pop Culture. Today we are going to be talking about a super cool guy who is super difficult, but also super fun. I know I said super a bunch of times, but he would kind of expect that. He would, he would call that part of hyper-reality. Where I, Anyway, I'll explain in a second. So, Jean Baudrillard, he's a French guy, so you know if you want to practice saying that, it's Jean Baudrillard. And he was a really provocative writer. He, I think, gained most of his attention in the 80s and continued to write until his death in the uh, early 2000s. And there's lots we could talk about. He's actually, as I'll show in the clip, he influenced a lot of other people as well. He comes on the backs of a lot of the people we've talked about, Freud, Marx, um, Althusser, different people who have been writing that we've studied earlier. He also adds a number of interesting elements and was sort of quoted in The Matrix and in a lot of other places that you'll, you might recognize after looking more closely into this. Today, however, I don't want to go nuts in all different directions, which we definitely could. I just want to talk about two things. The procession of simulacra, which, if you don't know what that means, it's totally okay. And Disneyland, which I'm sure you know what that means, but maybe not the way Baudrillard thought about it. So, I like to use the example of an apple when I'm talking about the procession of simulacra. And I'm going to look at my notes here to make sure I, I say things right. But Baudrillard says that the procession... So, first of all, the procession of simulacra. So, procession, you know, like a parade. Think of a parade. And then simulacra uh, is a simulation, right? So, it's is very similar, almost indistinguishable from the real, but it's not real. Although it gets complicated. It's very hard to talk about this because he says that once you get into this field, you can't distinguish anymore. So there is no difference between the real and the hyper real, he calls it, or the simulation. And so you can't distinguish, but at the same time, they're not the same. This is just going to be super complicated. And let me just say that I want you to have fun with this. Most students, at the end of the year, at the end of the full year, if they take both courses, always say that Baudrillard is among their favorite, even though they don't understand what the fuck he's trying to say. That can be fun, and it should be sort of exhilarating to think about. Don't start stressing. This is not one of those things where I expect you to, you know, check boxes and um, establish the correct answer. I just want you to think about this. So that said, Baudrillard says there's, there's sort of four stages, and he's writing at a time where the first Iraq war, the Gulf War, was going on, and he was interested in how Vietnam was captured by film and camera and all of these elements, these media elements, and so he says that a lot of these things really didn't happen. Not, not that they didn't happen, like, you know, in Iraq or wherever it is that we're talking about, but they happen in a way that's televised and mediated, which makes them a, a separated from the, the real. And the real is a, a, an idea that comes from psychoanalysis. So Freud, but more so Lacan, Jacques Lacan, who we, we've sort of talked about with, um, with Althusser, but we haven't really gotten into. And he's even more difficult to understand. But it's fun. Trust me, it's fun. Think about apples, just basic apples. So if you think about the first step, of the procession of simulacra. He says that the reflection of a basic reality is what's going on. So, this is, again, this is my example. So, if, if anyone's watching this who's like a Baudrillard scholar, you might have some issues and that's fine. But to introduce it, think about, think about like a caveman who goes and picks an apple and eats that apple. Doesn't even have words for it yet, right? He just picks an, a natural apple, a real apple, and eats it, right? That's like the basic reality. That's probably what you think you live in. Sorry that you don't, but um, that's like the, the first stage. So you have just this thing, and then you're experiencing this thing, and that's as close, as, as close to the real, the real thing as you can get. But we, yeah, we definitely don't live in that anymore. So, but then, yeah, so the caveman, if we follow through in this, has to eventually start talking about the apple and saying what the apple is and comes up with the word apple if he's speaking modern English. And so that starts to mask or pervert a basic reality. And that's because you're starting to represent it, right? You're starting to 
draw it, maybe. So maybe he draws a cave painting of an apple, or maybe you as a child drew an apple. I know I was always taught like the red crayon is for the apple, and then maybe you draw a green leaf, and that's what an apple is, right? So that's your, it's not an apple, it's your representation of an apple. So it's starting already to, you can see that we're getting one step removed from the real. But that's how everything works. Once you say, hey, I ate an apple, you're representing it through language like we've talked about before, through myth perhaps, and so you're already moving a little bit away from the reality, right? Then, so that's the, the second stage is masking and perverting a basic reality, which means, you know, slightly altering it if you want to think about it like that. Then, um, the third stage masks the absence of a basic reality. So this I like to think about the, um, the grocery store, right? So we know that apples grow on trees and orchards now because even that is, you know, a man-made thing. So the caveman didn't have an orchard, right? He would have found an apple maybe. But now we have orchards, which are already perverting nature in the sense that they're changing it. So not perverted necessarily as bad, but there's this like natural outcropping of apples, but then people start planting rows of trees and they call it orchards. And, you know, that's already perverting what a natural order would have. But then you go to a grocery store and you get a really red apple and you think, oh, that's great. That's just like the picture I drew when I was a kid, right? You're starting to get pretty far removed from reality in that point. So yes, you're really in a grocery store eating an apple or buying an apple first, hopefully. Um, but you are already quite removed from that experience that that caveman would have had. And I say caveman because we think of that as like pre-culture, right? It's not 100% accurate, but the caveman doesn't have all these apparatuses to mask and pervert that reality. We do because we go to Ingalls or whatever supermarket you're going to and you buy a nice red apple, you trade your money for this apple, which is exchanged, right? Maybe you saw an ad for the apple or for produce in your, um, in your newspaper or whatever it is, in your app probably. And so that masks the absence of a basic reality because in that case, First of all, is it organic? Probably not, right? Unless it has a, even organic, what does that even mean anymore, right? We're getting into all these symbols that we don't, natural, what is a natural apple? And why would you, why would you say that it's a natural apple unless it probably isn't a natural apple the way that we would think of it, right? Then we're getting into all these like advertisements and these like um, catchphrases and these symbols. So the apple is at the grocery store, designed to sit there in front of the aisle with all these other apples already picked for you, already way removed from some kind of natural order, and we don't even think about like where it comes from necessarily, right? Your apple's probably not even American, and yet, you know, you just walk to the store, you drive to the store, and you pick this apple, and so you don't even think about all the reality that's been separated from you. Also, I don't know if you know this, but they have Obviously, scientists and, and manufacturers of different kinds have made apples more, um, more solid and stable, meaning that they won't rot as quickly through genetic alterations and through chemicals. They've put chemicals probably on the apples so that bugs and different things wouldn't get into them so that they would last through the frost. They've actually, in some cases, put DNA from things like shrimps because they stay red under cold conditions. And so people want really red apples because that's the kind of apple they draw. Not the kind of apple that ne necessarily exists in reality, like in some first order reality that we can't even get to anymore. But this apple now is designed to look like that apple you would draw as a child. And that is the, the better apple, even though it's so far removed that we're not even comparing it to like a natural apple. We're comparing it to the apple in our mind, which is probably more red than it would ever be in, in real life and more round than it would ever be in real life and all of these things, right? And so we've genetically engineered the apples that we eat to look more like the apples that we draw, which is pretty fucked up when you start to think about it, right? That's what Baudrillard draws attention to, is these weird changes that we do in our culture. Finally, we get into, yeah, so this is the last step. Um, we get into a state in which it bears no relation to any reality, whatever. It is its own pure simulacrum. Meaning that this apple, if you want to think about that, doesn't refer to anything earlier anymore. It's its own symbol, like it's, it's lost, it's separated from reality, it doesn't even think about reality anymore, or the real. Now it's just its own sim symbol. And I think about 
the computer that you might be working on or what or the phone that you might be watching this on what's on the back of it perhaps maybe it's an apple symbol that of course that apple has nothing to do really with the apple that you might eat especially with the apple that that caveman might eat and yet we call it apple right you might have stock in apple and you might think about uh Steve Jobs as creating apple um it's so far removed that this apple refers to nothing to do with orchards or eating or anything right we're actually talking now about phones and tech and there's a reason they chose that i mean the apple is you know the apple of knowledge or the fruit of knowledge from um uh, judeo christian history or the bible and things like that right um adam and eve and the apple a tree of knowledge so that might be one of the reasons they picked it one of the first great computer programmers or computer scientists alan turing died after eating a poisoned apple um which we can debate but it seems that he poisoned himself because at the time he was gay at a t- at a time and place in his culture in the UK when you couldn't be gay and so even though he helped the war efforts the second world war efforts by designing what we now would call a computer um uh, he was chemically castrated which again is a way of getting away from a natural order and changing somebody chemically right but he was he was very depressed and he was treated horribly and so he committed suicide or died at least by eating a uh, poisoned apple and of course who else ate a poisoned apple snow white and anyway there are all these cultural things elements that get tied to apple which is probably why Steve Jobs created Apple computers, right? Because and there think of all the things we say, you're the apple of my eye. It's an English expression and so anyway, these apples have nothing to do with what that caveman was eating and that's basically what I would argue Jean Baudrillard was thinking or kind of how you could explain what he's talking about in his procession of simulacra. So basically, our culture in general has gotten so far away from the things that they're supposed to represent that there's not even a connection anymore like you can't even trace it back so it's not just like oh here's a thing and i'm calling it an apple and so now it means apple and we have this cultural baggage about what apples are and i can start making phrases like you're the apple of my eye no now we're trading stocks on apple which has nothing to do with apples it's actually computers but it doesn't even really sell computers anymore it's more like th- what we think Apple does and that's why the stocks go higher or low because of the potential that it has in the stock I won't even get into the stock market but Bodro was interested in things like the stock market because people aren't really trading commodities anymore right you might own or your parents probably own stock in say oil futures or some something like that right or gold let's say but they they're not even thinking about gold or oil they're just thinking this is a stock that will hopefully get higher because other people think it should get higher and boom this is where heads might start to explode and what you realize is that nothing is real this is what students start joking about in my class usually when we're teaching when i'm teaching it and when we're talking about it is that nothing is real and it's true but it's also you know a simplified version of this but yeah if you start thinking nothing is real very much like the matrix and um the, like i said the matrix was inspired to some extent on jean baudrillard or by jean baudrillard it's that idea that like yeah you think that you're living a normal life but you're actually living a simulated life and we could get into this you know you think you're a man or a woman right i'm not saying you're not but you're also simulating in a sense what you think a man or woman should be and so in that sense you are simulating a man or a woman you're not a man or a woman you're a simulation of a man or a woman um it's better when we can discuss this when i'm doing a video it's not as easy because i'm sure you're saying things in your head like I'm a fucking man or I'm a woman but you know when you think about how we act how we portray ourselves these are very much sort of imitations that we can't who is the original man and the original man definitely didn't wear a suit and act the way I do and yet I might present myself as a man and so I'm copying other men before me but I'm also have no idea who the first man was and the, there was no first man really not in the sense that we're talking about now so If you're not even a man or a woman, then you're definitely not things like an American. Even if you are an American citizen, right? Like what is an American? I don't know, but we're probably acting like we think Americans should act because we've seen other people act the way we think Americans act and so we've kind of copied that and so we're simulating it, but we're simulating it so well that we think it's real. This is what Baudrillard calls hyperreality. We are all simulating and we're all 
dealing and trading in, in symbols and, and simulations. And Disney, that's my last point here. Disney is the ultimate symbol, at least ultimate example of a symbol of a, a simulacrum. Because as a simulation, we know, that we know that we go to Disney World, maybe, Disneyland, and we see the rides and we see all, Mickey and all of these characters, right? And we know that that's not real. Like, we know somebody's in a mask. I hope you know this. Uh, I hate to break it to you. But yeah, Mickey, when he hugged you, was, you know, probably a teenager waiting for his smoke break. But in reality, we, we kind of know that, right? Um, what Baudra says is that we go to, you know, in L.A., we go to Disneyland, right? If you live in L.A., you can go to Disneyland within a half hour or whatever drive it is. And we know that the Disneyland part is a simulation over the world. It's not the real world. But what he says is that the simulation part actually exists when we go back to L.A. or when we go back to our home and we think we live our real life because those are also simulations. But because we can point to Disneyland and say, no, 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 last weekend I went to Disneyland, that was fake or that was a simulation, my life is real. That's the ultimate simulation is when you start to think that it's real. Um, this is heady stuff, and I know I say that every week, and yeah, it gets more complicated every week. But basically, so I'm not saying that you don't exist or that you don't matter, and you know, you can take this all in what I would call the wrong ways, but... On a very basic level, what Baudrillard is saying is that we act in a way that represents things that we don't, we simply don't remember where the original, we don't think about the original anymore, right? We might sell Apple stock, but we don't care about Apple so much. We might go to the store and pick up an Apple. We're not really thinking so much about where did this Apple come from and why is it so red and why is it marketed the way it is? And that's because we live in a hyper reality, a world that's more real than real, right? It's based on ideas of what the real is, and it's so far removed from what an actual real thing would be, we don't even know how to reference that actual real thing anymore. Uh, we can see this with fake news and these kinds of things. We can see this in modern day with the way that we, we use myth and other ideas like that to sell ideas of ourselves and others, and we, we get so used to it that we, don't, we forget that these are ideas, like these are sort of imaginary, these are symbolic. They're not real. And so real in his sense is a little bit different. So yeah, if I, if I were to push you or something, you would maybe really fall down, but you might also react like, oh my God, I can't believe he did that. And there would be all this symbolic interaction too, to the point where we don't really think about the actual material reality. What we think about is the symbolic interaction that we're dealing with. And that's where hyperreality becomes really important. So Disneyland. We know that that's fake. What we don't know, according to Baudrillard, is that we are fake. And so we think that we can come back from Disneyland and go back into our reality. But that's the ultimate fake. That's the ultimate hyper-reality or simulation. So difficult, yes. Interesting, yes, I hope. And we will talk more about how you might be able to interpret that in different ways and why it's, why it's an important concept. But similar to Roland Bard and the idea of myth, we're always doing more than one thing, right? We're all, so I may be acting like a man, but I'm also simulating what I think a man should be based on copies of copies of copies of men and take that and apply it to anything that you do, right? You might be a good student. And what does that mean? It probably means you're copying or simulating what you think a good student would do or be. And you might copy it so well that you actually become a good student, but you're also copying, which is not necessarily a bad thing, it's just the world we live in now. It's very complicated. Um, anyway, you're not real. I'm not real. Um, we're hyper real because we're part of the last stage of the process of uh, simulacra, the procession of simulacra. Um, it's totally fine if you don't get any of this. In fact, think about, this is my last bit. If you can simulate understanding, even if you can't understand this, if you can simulate to me understanding it, the result would be the same, right? You get a good grade. And so it's not a question of whether or not you understand what I'm talking about or what Baudrillard is talking about. It's just a question of whether you can simulate understanding enough to the point where I believe you. And then I can't tell the difference between a, a student who understands and a student who is very accurately simulating a student who understands. And you see how this can continue, I hope, and spread into other domains of our lives. So have fun with it. 
Um, enjoy your hyper reality because that's all you have. Cheers.